Hello, everybody. My name is Omid Gamami. My, uh, my wife is Gaúcha, by the way. I have a lot of Brazilian friends. They all call me Omiji, so you can call me Omiji if that works better. Um, what I want to talk about, um, first I'll say a little bit about my background. I spent 18 years at Intel Corporation. Uh, I worked my way up the purchasing department to eventually where I was running corporate purchasing operations and had a scope of about $2.2 billion. And they gave me the title of Godfather of Negotiation Planning. So that's always kind of stuck with me. What I want to talk about today, I was asked to speak about best practices for contract negotiations. So I have a question. How many people here have employees working for them that are managing contracts, negotiating contracts? How many, how many people here are negotiating contracts themselves? Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to go through four top areas, and these top areas are proven. If you can do these things, and if you can encourage your people to do these things, you will drive change in your organization. It's my experience that purchasing professionals spend 75 to 90 percent of their time in reactive, unproductive activities, and it's not because they're not smart. It's not because they're not educated. It's not because they don't know what they're doing. It's because the structure of the workload is wrong. And the vast majority, almost all purchasing professionals, when they got their first purchasing position, they had no experience before, no education in purchasing, and the training systems weren't good. And because of that, we don't have good systems in purchasing. The things that I teach, and I've been doing about thousands of hours of seminars around the world, the things that I teach help to cut the cycle time, how long it takes to negotiate and how to get better results, how to manage your suppliers better, how to manage your contracts better, to take purchasing to a much better place. So let's talk about these uh, key areas. Okay. So the four strategies are, the first one we're going to talk about is taking costs out of the supply chain. This is really, really important because the vast majority of the focus is on supplier profit reduction. And there's so many better areas to focus on on top of that. Not replacing that, but in addition to that, to get incremental, much larger cost savings. The second one we're going to talk about is writing contracts to prevent and remedy TCO excursion. So when I say TCO, I assume you know this expression, total cost of operations. The way you write the contract makes a big difference in TCO. Most buyers, most purchasing professionals don't invest enough time up front on the contract and they have a lot of problems afterwards. And they could be saving that time to focus on more strategy, more negotiations, and better total cost opportunities for the company. The third one is cost modeling and benchmarking for success. I'm going to talk about the four important areas to drive TCO reduction, it's my experience that most purchasing professionals don't know which ones to select or don't have enough experience in how to use these. Uh, we only have about an hour, so I can only go so deep in this, but at least I hope to classify which ones are best for which situations. And then finally, I want to talk about this concept of win-win. Everybody here has heard about win-win, is that correct? Everything I've heard about win-win has been incorrect, almost everything. Because people believe that win-win means we have a pie. We have this much that we want. You want this. I want that. Let's cut it down the middle and each of us gets half. But that's lose-lose because nobody gets what they wanted out of the deal. So I'm going to teach principles today how you can achieve win-win and hit your highest objectives. Now, if you're not negotiating contracts here, I want a commitment from all of you. And that commitment is you go back to your organization, you're going to get this presentation. Share it with them, please. If you do these things, if you follow my lead, I promise you, you're going to save a lot of time in your organization in how purchasing gets done, and you'll get better results. There's a lot more depth and detail behind this. I teach a lot of seminars. Every slide could be a one-day seminar. So please feel free to contact me. After we're done, I'm going to raffle off some copies of my books, and I have a special offer for all of you. So with that, let's please get started. <clears throat> The first one we're going to talk about is taking costs out of the supply chain, okay? And here's the thing. We have some traditional price reduction techniques that all of you are familiar with. I'm not even going to talk about them much. 
but I want to run through them so that we're on the same page. Okay, we all understand what we're talking about. We all do supply base reduction. We try and reduce the supply base to, ag to aggregate spends, put more spends to a smaller amount of suppliers. We do that spends aggregation. We don't want to sp spread our spends and our expenditures out of uh, over too many suppliers. We do commodity and category management strategies. We try not to have generalists, we try and have specialists who have expertise like the suppliers do. We try and do e-purchasing and we're implementing that to get rid of uh, the transactional element of purchasing and to make sure that when the customers place an order, it's already under contract. We don't need it to go through purchasing and purchasing can focus on more value added activities. We have negotiation strategies that we're all taught, behavioral psychology methods to drive lower total costs with suppliers. We have cost models that are data-based methodologies to drive down to lowest total cost. We have benchmarking that we do through RFP, request for pro proposal, request for quote, request for information. We have bidding that we do with suppliers. These strategies are not going to go anywhere, so I'm not even going to talk about these because I think every person in this room to one extent or another is already driving these. But the problem is, they're not enough. And that's going to be the key message of this section. If this is all you're doing, it's not enough. We have to take it to the next level, and I'll explain why. Now here's the supply chain, right? And this is a very simplified view. We start over here with your supplier's suppliers, your supplier, and then here's you, right? This is purchasing, okay? Then we have your customer and customer's customers. Now it's actually much more complex than this, but you get the picture. This is what it looks like. So what happens? We want to try and remove costs from the supply chain. Does everybody agree? That's the goal, is to take costs out of the supply chain. It's not enough just to push costs. You want to actually remove them because that benefits the whole supply chain. Today, it's companies competing against each other, but in the future, it's going to be supply chains competing against each other. So when you go to a supplier, and whenever you negotiate, you have to think, what is the supplier hearing? How do they feel about this? When you say to the supplier, give me a better price, for whatever reason, for bidding, benchmarking, total cost analysis, whatever you've done, you go to the supplier and you say, give me a better price, you know what they hear, right? What they're hearing is, make less money, so I can have some cost savings. That's what they hear, okay? So we have to remember that. So two things happen. The first thing is, you're only focusing on one small linkage point in this supply chain. This entire supply chain has costs, doesn't it? Does it not? It's full of costs. But we're picking this little link in between called profit between you and the supplier. So that's the first thing when we do what happens when we focus on price. We're saying I'm going to ignore everything else in the supply chain and I'm just going to focus on this. The second thing that happens is you're not actually taking costs out of the chain. What you're doing is you're moving these costs down the chain and you're pushing them. So it hasn't benefited anybody in the chain. It hasn't made the chain more nimble, it hasn't made it more agile, hasn't made it a more competitive supply chain. You just pushed costs down the supply chain. Now I'm not here to say stop asking for a lower price. For as long as purchasing is around, we're always going to ask for a better price, right? That's never going to go away. But we cannot stop there, is the message. So there's a challenge. There's a challenge here, but with that challenge, I want to present you with an opportunity. The issue I have is when I listen to presentations on supply chain, when I read about supply chain, they're interesting, everybody understands it, but you go back to your desk and you don't know what to do differently. You understand? Because you may not have an end-to-end -end supply chain. You may not have the systems. You don't have those things, and so you have an academic understanding, but no ability to execute. What I'm going to give you today, in a very short, shortened version, is an ability to execute at a level that doesn't require those things. So how do you do this? How do you drive this when the majority of the companies in this room, in industry, in every company, don't have this end-to-end -end supply chain, where you have a glass pipeline of information, uh, where you know everything that's happening, where the inventory is, where the demand is, it just doesn't exist in most companies. It doesn't exist. So that's the big challenge we have. How do we, how do we derive some cost savings benefits then? And the opportunity that you have, that your buyers can start tomorrow, 
when they go back to work, when you share these concepts with them, is they can capture the area that is in their control. And that's two of the end-to-end -end links. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we may not have the systems and the communications infrastructure to go to the customer and the customer's customers or to the supplier's suppliers, but certainly we can look inside our entire company and we can look inside the supplier's company, can we not? Beyond just give me a better price, make less money so that I can report cost savings. And so I'm going to show you the types of things we can do. And the clincher is you tell suppliers that if you do this, if you follow my lead, you will be more competitive, you'll have a better stronghold on my business, and you'll be able to better get business from other customers, you'll be a better supplier and get the supplier excited about following you. So then you expand it to this overall growth. So let's give some examples. I want to, and these are all real examples, companies I've worked with that I've identified ex ways to take costs out of the supply chain. And as we walk through them, you'll see not one of them impacts is saying, make less profit so I can report more cost savings. <clears throat> there was a company that had an outsourced call center. Okay, so they were receiving calls on behalf of the company. Well, we did an analysis because this was costing a lot of money. You know, it was costing a lot of money. And when we did the analysis, we found out that 80% of the calls were on the same questions. 80%. And so we realized we didn't need human beings sitting there answering 80% of the same questions all day. We were able to dramatically reduce that by change, changing it to a frequently asked questions web page, sending out a communication to all the customers and saying, here's the information you've been asking us regularly. Here's, we want to share it with you. It's documented. And we were able to reduce that call center size by 80%. It was a big pass through savings. Another one, this is actually my favorite example. I worked with a company that was requiring their supplier to take standard piping, okay? Standard piping that the supplier produced all day long for other customers, except they, they were always having them stamp their name every three feet. Every three feet they had to put their name, the customer's name, the customer's company name on the piping. Well, the piping was going underground. It was getting buried. Do you follow me? <clears throat> the piping was getting buried. And so we realized when we went to the supplier and say, what are the kind of things we can do to take costs out of the supply chain? They said, do you know how much it's costing us to put your name every three feet on this pipe? And you're burying it. Why do you need your name on it? And so this was miles and miles and miles of pipe. They saved a dramatic amount of money by switching from a custom part to a standard piping that went underground. It did not affect supplier profitability. And the supplier wanted to get on board with this. Now this one I'm not involved with, but it bothers me every time I buy coffee in America. I'm not going to say the name of the company, but I want you to pay attention. They had, there's a major coffee retailer, and every time they pour shots, what happened to me was I watched them pouring my drink. There's three drink sizes. One has one shot, the medium one has two shots, the big one has three shots. You know what I mean by the shots, right? Well, I ordered... Uh, I ordered the smallest one with one shot, and I watched the lady pour two shots and pour one down the drain. Their machine does not have the capability to pour single shots. And I said, you just threw away my shot. She said, yes. I said, do you always do that? She said, all day long. I said, do all of your stores do that? All day long. In addition, at the end of the day, all the coffee that's left in that big, huge container, they throw away. All the syrups that are left in those bottles, if it's open, they throw away at the end of the day, and they open new ones. So, you know, we could have a debate about quality and whether or not you want fresh every day, but these are all supply chain costs. If you had a machine that could pour one, two, or three shots instead of only two at a time, you could have a dramatic opportunity to reduce supply chain costs. Do you agree? It's huge. Has nothing to do with reducing the supplier's profit. Inventory reductions and reduce shipping costs because of more frequent and accurate customer demand updates. You have no idea what a difference it makes just when you can convince the customer, especially with direct materials, to give more frequent forecasts and more accurate forecasts and give a more disciplined process. When you do that, this, so it reduces risk in the supply chain and it reduces the amount of inventory that needs to be held. And if you can get an agreement with the supplier on a more disciplined process that allows them to lower their inventory, then you can also get an agreement to re reduce the pass-through because there's nothing for free. You're paying for that inventory building up. Is that not right? Absolutely, it happens. 
Uh, manufacturing cost reductions due to adjustment of overly rigid quality requirements. I was working with a company that measured their quality defects in defects per million, okay? But what we realized was they had it, and as you know, the higher you take the quality, the more it costs. They had it so far above the competitors and also so far above consumer expectations, it was costing them a lot of money. We realized we could take increase the defects per million by just a slight amount and bring about a significant reduction in costs and consumers would still be happy and they would still be performing better than the competition. It took costs out of the equation. Manufacturing cost reductions due to customer specific modification requirements. And so if your customers, when I'm talking about customers, you know I mean internal, right? Your internal clients. If you have customers, especially who are engineers, well, engineers like their toys. They like to play with things. They like to go to the supplier and say, well, let's try this, let's try that. Can you add this feature? And without knowing it, they add complexity, they add costs to the equation. And they also add risk and legal liability. If they're flying over to the supplier's facility and telling them to change your manufacturing line to do this or do that, you're not only adding costs, but you're also adding legal liability. There's a lot of discussion that could happen there. Those kind of things, you have to ask the supplier, are we telling you to do things that are adding cost? Because there's a problem. Suppliers are taught, salespeople are taught one thing, and they're taught the customer is always right. So when you ask them to do something that's not smart, they're not going to tell you it's not smart. They'll do it and they're going to charge you for it. And that's the big problem. They're taught that the customer is always right. And so you have to teach your suppliers, sometimes I'm wrong. And if I ask you to do something that increases total cost, tell me. Don't just give me what I asked for, tell me. That's very important. So now, what that takes me to is an extremely powerful concept. I want you to all share this with your organizations, please. We have this feeling that purchasing has to have the knowledge. Purchasing has to have the experience. They have to make the decisions with suppliers. And that if we ask the supplier how something should be done, that it takes away from our power. It takes away from our position. But it's not true. It's not true. The definition of a good leader is someone who surrounds themselves with smart, with smart people and makes good decisions. Your suppliers, if you think about this, <coughs> First of all, purchasing's biggest enemy is thinking they're smarter than suppliers. And I want you to hear everything I have to say before you disagree. Purchasing's biggest enemy is arrogance, is assuming you have all the answers. Because the supplier understands their industry better than you, no matter what. They understand their cost structure better than you, they understand their manufacturing better than you, and they have one huge benefit. And that huge benefit is you're only buying from them for this particular purchase. But they have many, 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 many customers who are buying the same things, and they're watching the other customers do something smarter than you, and they're also watching other customers make mistakes. And you learn much more from your failures than you do from your successes. We spend so much energy benchmarking and trying to gather research and information about how to do things best, and you have the supplier right there, right there with all the answers because they're doing this with all these other companies. If in janitorial, janitorial, if you're having your trash taken out five days a week and you tell them to do that, well, they'll do it. But if you ask them, they might say, you know what, our other customers have it taken out three, three days a week and nobody complains, right? But if you don't ask the question, you won't find out. You might find out, you might find out that you're doing something that's not smart from a, uh, I had a company that was doing, the supplier was doing outcoming, outgoing quality inspection to the customer's requirements, and then the customer was doing incoming qu uh, quality inspection to the customer's requirements. It was redundant and unnecessary. It's an opportunity to take costs out of the supply chain. So what you have to do is tell your suppliers up front, you don't sell me a product or service. That's not what you do. Your job is to make me successful. So if I do something that's not smart, if I ask you to do something that adds to total cost, you have to tell me, and you have to make them feel comfortable that they can tell you that. So for instance, when you send out a request for a proposal, okay, you should tell them, I want two responses. The first response is exactly what I asked for, right? We give specifications or scope of work. Is that not right? The second response is what I should have asked for, okay? And then you can tell them, 
we will give great attention to the innovation in the responses that come back and it'll be a big part of our supplier selection criteria. Help them, have them help you find a better way to solve the business problem. Because if you, again, I'm gonna say this over and over, if you ask them to do something that's not smart, they're not gonna tell you it's not smart. If you ask them to do something that adds total cost, they're not gonna tell you because the customer is always right. That's what the supplier's taught. And on top of that, in our RFPs, we say failure, failure to comply with the exact specifications shall result in potential disqualification. So we discourage this behavior. I want you to change that. Start encouraging this behavior. Encourage innovation from the suppliers because they have much more uh, knowledge than we do on this topic. So you can ask them, are there any specifications or scope of work that can be modified? Are there bells and whistles, extra features that the customer wants that aren't necessary? Are there contract items that are costing a lot of money, things that maybe we don't need? Is one of the supplier's other customers doing this smarter? You have free benchmarking information from your supplier, and if you're not using it, it's a big lost opportunity. Okay, so everybody clear on this section we just covered, taking costs out of the supply chain? I'm quite limited on time, so please forgive me for going fast. <coughs> the second thing we're going to talk about is writing contracts to prevent and remedy TCO excursions. And I'm going to say this again, it's my firm belief in every company, in every industry, in every country, the purchasing professionals are, are spending 75 to 90% of their time in, in non-value added activities. And I was there, so I feel like I can say that. I'm pointing the finger at me too. Okay, but there, there is a way out. That's the good news. There is a way out, but it, and it does not require doing additional work. It requires doing your work differently and having a different behavior in how you do your work. I'm going to make the contention that if you structure your contract activities 5% more work up front, you'll save 70% work on the back end. Okay, so let's go through how that works. The first thing is, what you want to do is eliminate supplier modifications to your standard contract. We've all seen it happen. You, you give a supplier a copy of your contract and what do they do? They take the red pen, they mark it up, right? We don't like this, we want to add that, we want to do this. Am I not wrong? This happens. Okay, but it's your responsibility not to let that happen. You cannot let that happen and I'll show you how to avoid that happening. And there's practices and behaviors that the buyers have that encourage this behavior. We actually are begging the supplier to engage in this behavior. And you know, I love the lawyers, I love the legal people, but the big joke for me is that you know, when you send it to the legal department, the contract with all the red lines, that's where contracts go to die. And it gets stuck there for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then you can't finish your negotiation, right? So we wanna cut that cycle time, we wanna finish contracts faster, and we wanna finish it with your terms. So the first one, I think probably most of you are doing, but you want to give a copy of the T's and C's. When I say T's and C's, the terms and conditions, up front with the RFQ and RFP. So I don't think that's a big surprise. It's the steps that come after that where I want to, want to see the big change. Now here's the big deal. If you take this page in my presentation and throw everything else away, your buyers are going to save so much time. Just try it and send me an email, please and tell me about it because I get these emails every week from buyers tell me I love it, this worked. What you do, now you folks send a supplier selection grading matrix, right? You say these are the four criteria or the five criteria we're going to use to select a supplier. Do you not do that? You tell them how, wh how you'll make the decision of uh, its cost, quality, safety, and we're going to grade your response and then select a supplier. Now what you do, here's the trick. <laughs> You have your categories, and they can be whatever you want the categories to be. But the last one, number of supplier requested changes to buyer's contract, and give it a big number. And when you do that, the supplier is going to look at that and say, oh no, if I put the red marks on this contract, I might not get the business. And it stops. It stops. And do you know why they put the red marks on the contract? The reason is because buyers Again, I'm one of you, okay, so I, I have to be honest. Buyers are afraid of contracts. They say, oh, we're gonna do the contract last. Let's negotiate, we save the contract for last. The legal people are gonna do the contract. 
And you know what the, the supplier does? They lick their lips like a lion because after you agree on price with them, they have nothing left to lose. Nothing left to lose, right? They got their price. They got their price and so they're gonna put out, pull out the best red pen they have and mark up that contract and there's nothing you can do. There's nothing left you can do. You can't let that happen. This has to be the first thing you negotiate and you negotiate it right here by setting expectations. And when you do that, what happens is the supplier will only convey and put a red pen on the things that they're dying over, the most, most important issues. And if they bring it up, then it deserves attention because they're willing to lose the business over it, right? And then you give them attention over it and you discuss the issue. If it needs to go to legal, it, needs, it goes to legal. But the problem with the legal department is <clears throat> it's not a revenue generating department, so there's never enough lawyers. And if all the buyers are saying, oh, we'll save the contract for last, we'll do that last. And if all the suppliers are marking it up, then legal has this many contracts to review, right? It takes four weeks for legal to get to a contract. So I help out the poor legal department, and I do a lot of training on teaching buyers on purchasing contract law. It's really important, um, it's really important to understand how it works. It's not understanding that is like going to the mechanic with your car and the mechanic starts to explain what's wrong. You say, oh, no, 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 I don't deal with that. Just give me the bill. Okay, you're going to get a lot of problems when you do, th do that. You have to understand what's going on in the contract. So when you include this in your supplier selection matrix, I promise you, the red marking of contracts will stop. The first time you do it, it's going to stop. And you'll have so much time left on the back end. But that's a big disservice, and that is why they have so many excursions afterwards. Supplier excursions, performance excursions, warranty excursions, customer excursions, delivery excursions. All these things they're chasing all day long, which is the reason why they don't have time to get strategic, to do supplier management, to do supplier continuous quality improvement, right? The contract has to be customized. A little bit more time needs to be spent up front so that this poor contract knows what it is it's buying and so that you have the right protections. So just attaching the supplier quote is not enough. It's not enough. For instance, you have, let's say you're buying capital equipment for a manufacturing line. Your standard contract says you have a three-year warranty. Okay, great. But it's not gonna say how quickly they have to remedy breach of warranty. In other words, if it takes the supply, you know, you've got manufacturing line not working. The, the, the capital equipment is broken and it's under warranty. The contract, since it doesn't know if you're buying office supplies or capital equipment, you don't have a standard three-year warranty, but it doesn't know it's urgent to get it fixed. It's not going to say it has to be fixed within 24 hours. It's not going to say who's going to pay for an engineer to fly out. It's not going to say if it's business or calendar days in terms of how long it takes to get closed. You have to add this. If you don't add this, just having a three-year warranty doesn't help you. It doesn't help you. <clears throat> And so what has to happen is the buyer has to sit down with the internal customer and ask this question. Because the customer is only thinking about what do I need today? They're not thinking about what might happen tomorrow. You have to say, what's your nightmare? What is every single thing that might go wrong in the, with this after we sign the contract? Not before, after. Every single thing. What are things that you've seen happen? What are things that bother you? What are things that have happened to your peers? and list it all out. This has to be a one hour discussion. List out everything and keep asking more questions, more questions. What's everything that can go wrong with this supplier after we so sign the contract that's gonna cause a problem for you and for your business? Then what you do is you take those things, those are all excursions, you reverse engineer those. You take them apart and you put each one, you make a custom supplier performance clause for each one of those. You know, and if you don't do this, it's kind of like if you have children, if you don't tell children your expectation and then all day long you catch them doing something wrong, but you never tell them how you want them to behave up front, it's, all day long you're gonna be telling the kids what they're doing wrong. Is that not true? You have to tell them up front how you want them to behave and then the behavior later hopefully will be better, right? Not all children, sometimes mine don't support that, but. You want to give expectations up front. When you put it in the contract, it's a lot more clear. So it's, we're not done yet, though. For each one of these, not only are we going to say this is an expectation, we're also going to say failure to, to adhere is either a material breach of contract or a minor breach of contract. 
And this gets the supplier's attention, right? This gets the supplier's attention. I'm sure you have these concepts in your contract law because I've taught contract law in, a, in 10 different countries. All of them had this concept of material breach of contract. If something's important to you, if delivery is important, you say on time deliver, failure, failure to deliver on time shall be construed as a material breach of contract. It gets their attention. Their lawyers circle that and tell them, you guys better deliver on time. And, but if you don't say that, then they don't know what's important to you and you have nothing to point at later. The worst possible situation that you can get into with contracts is the supplier is doing exactly what the contract says and nobody's happy about it, right? Because you had a bad contract. They're not performing to your expectations, but they're doing exactly what the contract says. And so you can't say anything. The next thing you want to do is you want to make yourself the exclusive person who can define whether or not there's, there's a breach. Everything I'm teaching today is from my own experience. I had situations, you know, for instance, with software where they're developing something and I say there's a bug and I point at the contract and I say there's a software bug, it has a defect. And they say, no, that's not a bug, it's not a defect. And what I realized is it was my word against their word. After that, I said, nunca mais. So after that, always I wrote in there, a buyer shall have the exclusive authority to determine whether or not there was a defect or a bug in the software. And you can do that with anything you're buying. And then that way, your opinion is the only one that counts. Now, it may sound like I'm talking about win-lose, but these are not things you can lose on. We're going to talk about win-win later, and I'll show you exactly how to make the supplier successful. And then there needs to be a very clear remedy for breach. And so remedy is that cure period. What happens when the contract is breached? You have to state how long it's going to take for them to fix the breach when they're not doing what the contract says. Is there going to be um, um, any costs involved and who's going to pay for that? You might have damages associated. All of these things, if you define everything up front and don't try and hide it from the supplier, instead say, I want you to pay attention to this section because these are my expectations and this is how you need to perform. And guess what? When you do these things, you have much less problems after signing the contract. But if you don't include these things, then you're not giving them expectations. It's like a manager who doesn't tell their employee how they want them to perform. And the first time the employee finds out is when they get their performance review. That's a problem, right? You want to know up front. How are you going to perform? How will you be rewarded? How will you, how will you be reprimanded? Does everybody follow me so far? Am I talking too fast? Okay, so that's part of what we want to do. We want to prevent. We don't want to have buyers that are really good when a fire happens, you know, an excursion, that they're really good at putting out fires all day long. That's worthless. You want buyers who don't let fires start. That's a good buyer who does not let the fire start. And that's what I'm teaching with these contracts. And contracts are a pay now or pay later process. If somebody tells you, I don't have time to do this, you have to say, you can't afford not to do this. Because when you pay later, you're going to pay 25 times as much. 25 times as much. But if you pay a little bit up front, you save so much time later. Life becomes easier and you focus on what you're getting paid to do as a purchasing professional. Supplier management, continuous quality improvement, critical sourcing strategies, and all of these kind of things that make the organization better. But nobody hired purchasing people to put out fires all day. It's not what we got hired to do. And so, by definition, we cannot prevent unpredictable excursions, but we can prevent all predictable excursions. There's no excuse for predictable things going wrong, for late deliveries, for quality problems. All these things are predictable. So you have to put measures in place to make sure that doesn't happen. So it has, you have to have those custom contract clauses. And when you go through that discussion with the supplier, you're able to identify those areas for anything that is predictable. For instance, have you ever had, and I have clauses for all of these that I've developed that I teach, and it's just a cut and paste. You put it in the back of your contract. Have you ever had a, a very uh, you know, fancy supplier presentation and they have the brochures and so forth that they show you, but later you find out that the product or service doesn't deliver what the brochure says, right? So you force them to put, uh, what we say, put your money where your mouth is. You can put a clause in there that says supplier warrants. And a warrant, a warranty just means that something is true. 
supplier warrants that their products shall perform to all of the specifications outlined in brochure number XYZ, and then that way you put them legally on the hook to perform to the brochure. And you don't even have to attach the brochure to the contract, but you're making them accountable for their marketing and for their sales pitch. You have many situations where it's kind of embarrassing, where you don't know how much you're spending with a company, right? And the reason is we don't have good systems, or for instance, if you're doing business with IBM, you go to the vendor list, it says i.b.m, IBM, IBM Inc, IBM Virginia, IBM Los Angeles. There's 30 IBMs in the system. Which one do you look at for expenditures? It's hard to get this information sometimes. It's, you can put a clause in there that says the supplier has to track it and report to you every month how, much, a month. how much are we spending so that you know you're not overspending how much you negotiated. Nobody likes it when you negotiate a contract for 100,000 hay ice and for one year and after one year you find out you spent 200,000 hay ice, right? We lost money. Everybody agree? So you can have the supplier track that and also tell you before you hit 100,000 hay ice, you must tell me in writing and notify me that we're hitting this amount so that you can renegotiate. Customer communication clause. We all have a problem where customers internally go and have uh, discussions with suppliers, yes? So discussions we don't like. Where they start discussing, they want to buy something new, they discuss quotation, they discuss price. It's something purchasing wants to be involved with. Is that correct? Well, you can have a clause in there, and I have, I have these clauses. You can have a clause in there that says, any time the supplier is contacted by any individual within this company, they shall not discuss price, they shall not provide quotations, and they shall immediately involve the purchasing department. Failure to do so shall be construed as a material breach of contract. Do you see? So never again is one of, will your supplier allow one of your other customers to go and establish new business without you knowing, without you having the opportunity to negotiate. Retroactive discounts. If it does happen that you negotiate a 100,000 hay ice contract and you actually spend 200,000, you can have a contract clause in there that says, should we overspend this contract, buyer reserves the right to renegotiate the contract and the pricing shall, the new pricing shall be retroactive to that point at which the contract was overspent. So that extra 100,000 hay ice you overspent, you still get to negotiate a discount on that, discount on that and it goes back to that time and you get a refund. You understand? This can be in your contract. But if it happens and you wait for it to happen without this clause, you're going to spend a lot of time and you probably won't be successful. You can have what's called the most favor favored customer clause. And if you have that in there, that clause tells you that nobody else in industry is getting a lower price independent of volume, no matter how much they're buying, and that you have the ability to audit to make sure this is true. And you can have this in your standard contract. And also you can say, we'll pay for the audit. And the supplier says, okay, you pay for the audit. However, if there's findings, if the audit finds something, they're responsible. And I have gotten some very, very big checks for companies from this clause. Return, refunds from the supplier because they were giving somebody else a better price and we found out about it. So it's, it's a great clause to have. Okay, so any questions on this section here that we just went through? This was customizing contracts to prevent excursions and to ensure good remedies and to slash the cycle time. If you follow my lead, you will cut contract negotiation cycle time by 75% and get better results. Again, I'm a little bit short on time, so I'm going fast. Please forgive me. <coughs> the next thing we're going to talk about is cost modeling and benchmarking for success. Now, the only thing I'm going, I can't teach how to do those here. It's just, it needs a full day. Um, but what we can do is talk about what are the four different types and how to use them. At least you can get your buyers on the right track and make sure they're there. So there's really four different types that we're looking at. The first one is a must-cost model. Now you may have different terms, okay? A must-cost model. The next one is a should-cost model. Third one is benchmarking. And the fourth one is a total-cost model. And any one of those can be used to drive TCO reduction. Reduction in your total cost of ownership, right? So let's talk about what these are and when you would use them. And that's really all I have time to get into with this presentation. <laughs> okay, so the must-cost model is really a budgetary constraint model. It's basically, let me actually, pardon me, let me talk about it, then I'll have that come up. It's basically used when you know that the amount of money you have is not enough. 
that you cannot use benchmarking, you can't use a total cost model. There's no situation where you're going to have enough money to buy what it is you need. And so normally we don't like to tell budget, right? The supplier asks, how much money do you have for this? We don't tell them. This is the one exception. So a cost model is when, a must cost model is when you know that price exceeds the budget under all scenarios. No matter how you look at it, you will never have enough money for it. And then so you go back to the supplier and you say, listen, I'm going to put my cards on the table. This is all I have. Okay, I can't, I'm not going to expect you to lose money <coughs> to work with me on this. You can't ask suppliers to lose money. We want healthy suppliers. But you can say, I, here's my problem. Here's why I need these units. You come back to me with a proposal. And if you don't have an idea now, I want you to think about it. How can we do this differently to meet this price? Maybe you take some features off the product. Maybe, you know, there's something differently you can do to take costs out of the supply chain, take costs out of the product or service, to change the scope of work or the specifications, to do it at an aggressive target of this price. And you would be amazed. Suppliers first say, we can't do it, we can't do it. But you send them home and you say, come back to me with a proposal in 48 hours. Okay, when they come back, they always come back with innovation. They always come back with innovation and with something new. And we're going to use the supplier's own game with them. You know, in America, I don't know if this happens here. Companies call. They call you at home, and then they talk to you about a product. You don't even know who the company is. They talk to you about a product. Then at the end, they say, how would you like to pay for this, Visa or MasterCard? Does that happen here? They don't ask you if you want to buy it. They ask you how you're going to pay for it. So you do the same with suppliers. You don't ask, can you produce a proposal? You say, when can you get me a proposal by? We're going to assume that they're going to give us a proposal, and you ask them to come back with a new and different way to do it at this price. The should cost is when you're trying to find out what should it cost for the supplier to manufacture or produce this good, or in the case of a service, to put that together. And you want to keep it simple. You don't want to get too complicated. But the only time you want to do that is when it's a custom product or service or a sole source provider, when you can't buy it from anybody else because it's painful to do a should cost analysis. It's painful to look at what are the internal cost components of a supplier. So it's not something you want to do all the time. Do you follow me? So it has to be a measure of last resort. If you know that you can't do it any other way, that you know you can't get it from any other company, then you cannot do an RFP, you cannot do an RFQ, you can't benchmark. The only thing that you can do, the only thing you have left is to do a should cost model and an analysis of their costs and you get something from them, an industry code. In America, we call it the NAICS, North American Industrial Classification System Code. It's five digits. And you use that to go and get their industry average profit margin. You put it on top of the cost. And then you arrive at, this is what it should be costing, but this is what you're charging me. Tell me why these numbers are different, right? The next one is benchmarking. And all of the, you're very familiar with benchmarking. You're all doing it. We do it with bids and so forth. In this particular case, the only time we're going to do that is when it's undifferentiated products and services. In other words, when the customer is relatively indifferent on which supplier is selected, then it's an ideal situation for benchmarking because you're simply working them against each other to see who can provide the lowest total cost solution. And you know that the answers you're getting back and the responses you're getting back are for the exact same proposal. And so that becomes a very powerful strategy. I won't talk about that one very much because I know you're all doing this. And then finally, the total cost is an important one. Um, and that's when you do the total cost model when there's a material difference between acquisition cost and total cost, okay? And so we've all had situations where we bought something, even in our personal lives, and we thought about the purchase price, we didn't think about the total cost, okay? And that's when you can get yourselves in trouble. It's happened to me in my personal life, it's happened to me in business. I think all of us have experienced that. I once negotiated a software contract and I got the lowest total cost, I thought. For sure, the lowest price. Nobody was getting a better price. I found out one year later, we spent more than the price I negotiated on consulting with that supplier. I didn't even think about consulting. So that was when I first started purchasing. That was my first big total cost lesson. So these are the four different types of models. And the most important thing is when to use them. If you use them in the wrong situations, you'll waste a lot of time. Everybody clear on these four? Okay, great. 
Now here's a really important concept. I, I want you to start thinking about suppliers will always give you discounts. When we do all those things we talked about, remember bidding, benchmarking, aggregate, aggregating spend, supply-based reduction, um, and commodity and category management strategies. Remember that slide I had? When we're doing all those things and suppliers give a price discount, the reason they're giving you that discount is they're saying their variable costs are reducing. Okay? They're getting economies of scale from variable price reductions. However, you just have to ask them one simple question. Supplier, when you're taking on my business, are you having to build another factory? Are you having to hire more management? Are you having to buy more capital equipment? If the answer to all of those is no, then what you know is they did not incur more fixed costs to pick up your business. Everybody get that? And so what happens, you have your fixed costs. Here's dollars and here's productions. We all know about variable costs. This is what they give you your discounts based on. We all know about fixed costs. This is plant, property, equipment. And it hits a wall. When you hit manufacturing capacity, then you need to increase that and it goes higher, right? However, when you increase their production, their average fixed cost per unit goes down. And supplier's cost per unit is average fixed cost per unit plus variable cost per unit. But if you don't bring this to their attention, they will only give you the benefit of variable cost per unit. You have to first ask them the question. And don't tell them why you're asking the question. Just ask the question. Are you having to, uh, in, to purchase more plant property or equipment to support our business? If the answer is no, then they are making it's, it's pure profit except for the variable cost. And they're reducing their cost per unit dramatically. And you're helping them do that. And you have to tell them, I understand. I know what's going on. Your average fixed cost per unit is reducing, and I don't. I won't accept a, a purchase price discount just based on variable cost reduction. I want to see a purchase price di discount also based on the fixed cost, average fixed cost per unit reduction that's coming with my business. I'm the one who's giving this to you. Everyone with me? Show them this graph. You have my approval. Take this graph and go show it to them. It, it gains a lot of negotiations. Because they're hoping you're not thinking about this. They're hoping you're only thinking about variable costs. I think that's my last one. On, oh, we've got a, one more. So cost modeling strategies. So here's some key rules. The first thing is, obviously, you want to have, if it's a big negotiation, really big strategic negotiation as a part of your ABC curve, um, you want to have visibility, you want to have a team that has visibility to the various cost components, finance, accounting, receiving, whoever it is that's going to have visibility. And by the way, as we move into supply chain management, these are not going to be purchasing in their internal business partners. It's going to be supply chain cost councils talking to each other and working to take costs out of the supply chain. It's going to be much more collaborative. Um, you need to differentiate between assumptions, estimates, and facts. Right? You have to differentiate, and every single item has to be labeled. Is this an assumption, is it an estimate, or it's a fact? Because you want to minimize the number of assumptions and estimates. They introduce risk and variability into your cost model. You want to start basic and add complexity later. A complex cost model is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. The more complex it is, the more likely it is that it's wrong. The smaller the cost model, the more basic it is. The fewer the assumptions and estimates, the better off you are. And what's really important, I'm going to keep pushing innovation. Don't just do what is cost analysis. Do what if. What could be? What if we did this? What if we changed that? What if we took this out? What if we killed that process? Don't just ask, what is it now? Ask, what could it be? And, and do cost analysis based on that. Then you want to do Pareto analysis. And I think you're all familiar with this. He was a French com economist. And he basically said that 80% of the costs are going to be in 20% of the transactions, or at least as it pertains to us. And so if I wanted to reduce the cost of this unit here, the last thing I would focus on is the screws. Because even if I can find 90% cost savings on the screws, I'm probably going to save one hay ice. Who cares, right? So I'll focus on the big expensive things in this. I'll do a Pareto analysis and start with the most expensive components and drive reductions there. And I won't even pay attention to cost savings opportunities with the screws. And what's really important is to separate controllable from uncontrollable costs right away. Because some costs are mostly uncontrollable. Whenever a company has tight budget, the first things they cut are travel 
entertainment, education, all of these things. But they don't, the first thing they do usually is not to cut employees and to sell buildings, right? Those are considered mostly uncontrollable costs. At some point, it might happen, but that's severe. So if something is uncontrollable, stop paying attention to it. Focus on controllable. Take the uncontrollable out. So that's a quick overview on the cost modeling. Again, each one of these can be their own three-day seminar. But I want to kind of give some tips and tricks here that you folks can take. Please do me a favor, and after you get this presentation, go and share it with your troops. Don't go back. Please don't go back to your desk and do business as usual again. That's the biggest risk with a great seminar like this, is we have to do business differently when we get back to the office. And so the last strategy is the most important one, in my opinion. There's a lot of training out there that teaches how to do win-lose. And I'm not a big proponent. I don't think we should establish strategies to get the upper hand, to make the supplier give more than they can, because when we get to supply chain management, that's not an option. It's all about collaboration and trust and partnering together to take costs out of the supply chain. We have to get good at win-win now. And the way to do that, I'm going to teach you a concession strategy that's so powerful. I've, I've written articles about a lot of this stuff, and this is one of them you can see on the internet. So the first thing I want to do is define win-win, because I think the traditional definition is wrong. And it's meeting your high-value objectives and ensuring the supplier feels good about the deal. You give them things to make them feel good about the deal. Remember, after the negotiation is done, the supplier has to go back to, the, to their facility, and their boss says, what happened? What would you get? And they don't want to say, I got nothing. I gave away all the price, and I didn't get anything in return. They don't want to say that, right? You have to help them feel good. You have to help them look good. The, the buyers who are, who are new, who are rookies, who aren't experienced, the way they do that is they give away on price. The buyers who are very experienced give high value, low TCO concessions. And I'm going to teach you how to identify high value, low TCO concessions. That's the key word that you want to teach your organization. And those help the supplier feel good about the deal while having minimal impact to you. Now here's the thing. Uh, I remember my first probably three months of negotiations. You know, I was 18 years at Intel, but the first three months, I didn't know how to negotiate. Like all of you, I landed in purchasing. I, I didn't know anything about purchasing. And because I worked for a big company, I thought I could throw my weight around. I thought I could get whatever I want. And I was getting whatever I wanted, but my suppliers weren't happy. And what I found out was they were getting their money back. Every time I needed something, they gave me a bill. They wanted money, and they got their money back. And so I found out my model was wrong. I needed to, give, I needed to make it win-win. And it only took me about three months to figure that out. But if you have an unhappy supplier, they will get their money back. Every time you call them and need something, they'll charge you for it. But if you have a happy supplier, they work with you. And so the art. It's an, uh, negotiations is an art and a science. The science is all about the analysis that you do before the negotiations. There was an American president named Abraham Lincoln, and he said, if I have eight hours to chop down a tree, I'm going to spend the first six hours sharpening my ax. That's the science of preparing for negotiations. You spend 80% of your time preparing, sharpening the ax. The art, and this is how you know when you're a good purchasing professional and when you have a good organization, is that you achieve your highest value objectives without sacrifice and the supplier feels great about the deal. That's when you know you're a good uh, purchasing professional. And the best situation, what I talked about before, is to give high value but low TCO concessions. And that's how you do it. So instead of saying the rookie buyers, the buyers who are new to purchasing, you know, in America, we call it the pie. They, they say, well, we're talking about price. That's the most important to both of us. Let's cut it down the middle. I get half, you get half. But both parties lose because neither party gets what they wanted. Instead, I want you to have many pies. And I'll talk about how you do that. The first thing is you have to find out what's a win for the supplier. And here's the problem with what purchasing does. We don't understand behavioral psychology enough. We think we're purchasing, we have to come into the room and we have to say, this is what I want. These are my expectations. But I want you to try something differently. Teach your people to go to the supplier and before you say, this is what I want, ask them, what do you need to be successful out of this deal? What's important to you? 
okay? And what happens is when you go into negotiations, they have a shield. The supplier has a shield, and it's up. And you want to get that down. You want them to get, you want them to know, like, and trust you, and to want to work with you. And one of the best ways to do that is to ask them their opinion, to engage them, and ask them what they need to accomplish out of this deal. Now, people think that this takes away from their power base, from their negotiation base, but it doesn't. It adds to it. It's funny. It works the same with children. If I tell my son, go clean your room, he's not happy about it. But I say, how about some options? Do you want to clean your room first, or do you want to go, go do the dishes? Then he's okay with it. Well, I think I'll go clean my room first. Everything changed. I gave him a choice. I gave him input. Do you see? We can do the same thing with suppliers, and it's genuine. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is don't assume you know why the supplier wants the business. This is a fatal flaw. If you assume that the reason the supplier wants the business is to get the highest price possible, then you're going to end up making uh, sacrifices in price. Don't assume you know. Be prepared to be surprised when you ask them. This, I think I sourced this from a bad supplier. It stopped working. Um, so what you want to do, I wrote an article about pre-negotiation sessions, and they're so important. You want to actually meet with the supplier. If it's a big negotiation, you want to meet with the supplier beforehand, ask them these questions. And also other things we talked about, like what's your capacity? Are you going to need new pr plant property equipment and so forth? But ask the questions of what's important to you. What do you want to get out of this deal? And when you ask them, what do you have to do? You have to write those things down, and then you tell them, this is what I heard, right? This is what's most important to you. This is what's second most important. This is what's third, third important. And when they're saying it, you can't do this. And shake your head or say, no, we can't do that. All you're doing is listening. And when you listen and you engage them, you make them want to make you successful. That's what happens. And by listening and by writing it down and by saying it back, you're not saying, I'm going to do those things. You're saying, I heard you and your opinion is important to me. You understand? And so listening solves 90% of your problems. All of your, it gets the supplier to want to make you successful and it allows you to identify what are the high value, low TCO concessions that you can make. You, want to, you know what I mean when I say concession? It's something you give away to get something. You never give away something for free. Whenever you give something away, you're getting something back. So when you ask the supplier what success needs for them and you play it back to them, you repeat it back to them, you have to ask them, tell me in order which one's the most important, second important, and third, impo third most important. And when you ask them, they're going to say something very generic. They're going to say, well, I want to do business with you. I want to have a good partnership. I want us to be friends. And you have to say, no, let's get into specifics. Those are important to me too, but I want to know specifically what are the things you need. Do you need to get paid by a certain date? Do you need testimonials from us? Are you, what are the things that would really help you as a company? What are the things you'd like to get out of this deal? And then make sure you have them in order. Then what you do on your own is you create a matrix. And let me show you what that matrix looks like. This is something I developed, and I teach about this. And this is just an example. So everything you see here is the supplier's desires, OK? So I'm writing them down. I'm not showing this to the supplier. These are the things they said they wanted. And it's not really important for you to read what that is, what it says. But for instance, here's one. Using the customer and firm name as a reference in advertising, OK? That doesn't impact your price, but giving a testimonial might mean a lot to them, OK? Or another one, uh, they might want to have payment terms of net 10. Well, normally we don't agree to pay in 10 days, but you have to do a cost analysis. If you can get a dramatic, um, dramatic reduction in price, why not? Why not do that? And so in all of these, I, you kind of categorize what's the perceived value with the supplier. So I gave it a one to five scale. Five is high and one to lo is low. But these are all pretty high because the supplier told you. And then you look at... What's the total cost impact to purchasing? And you say, how much does it cost us? We're measuring TCO. OK, this one costs us almost nothing to do a testimonial. To pay terms of net 10 in this economy, we're not earning much money in the bank, right? And so paying a little bit early doesn't cost us much. Um, you know, having a payment by the end of the quarter so that they can help their financial books 
doesn't cost us a lot. So what we do is we take, we take the difference between the one column here and this column. Five minus one is four. Four and a half minus one is three and a half. Five minus one and a half is three and a half. What that number represents is things that cost you very little and are very valuable to the supplier. Does everybody see that? You have to have this list. And then you have to think about what are the top things I want to achieve. The things that are most important to me, and you use this one for the biggest thing you need to achieve. Use that one for the second biggest thing you want to achieve. Use, pardon me, I should point here. Use this one for the third biggest thing you want to achieve. And use that one for the fourth biggest one. And then these you'll never give away because the number is too small. Do you see? Does everybody follow how this works? It's really important because if you're just giving away on price, that's a lose-lose strategy. If you're giving away things that cost you little but are valuable to the supplier, you can get a win-win negotiation. You can achieve your biggest objectives and not sacrifice on the things that are most important to you for TCO. Any other, are there any other questions on this before I move on? I know it's a lot of information here. Okay, so I'm going to have a call to action. And at the end of every seminar I give, I have a call to action. What that means is these are the things, if you're going back to work on Friday, then these are the things you tell your organization to start doing differently starting Monday. Because again, if we all go back to the work on Monday and do everything the same and eat shuhasko at night, something has to change. We have to do something different. So, by the way, I had a great shuhasko last night at Foga de Sham. This is the best barbecue in the world, I think. So, you guys do a great job with that. The first thing I'd really like you to focus on is to dramatically improve TCO opportunities through supply chain cost reductions. Tell your buyers, are you just pushing costs down the supply chain or are you also taking them out? And if they're not also taking them out, they're missing a big opportunity. You have to do both. The next one is to write contracts to slash cycle time and prevent and remedy supplier performance excursions. You slash the cycle time by putting that scorecard and not allowing the suppliers to mark up your contract. And then you put contract language in there that sets your expectations. And you also put contract language that says, what's the remedy for breach of my expectations? It's a material breach of contract. There's a uh, liquidated damage associated with it. Something, whatever it is, so that the supplier knows that these are the expectations. And I can't break these expectations. I have to follow it because there's consequences if I don't. The third one is to use the right cost models and benchmark strategies to drive best-in-class TCO. So recognize that we have four different strategies available to us, and we don't want to use them in the wrong cases. We always want to use them in the right cases. So I've laid out when you want to use them. If we want to talk about how to do those cost models, those are separate seminars. Uh, can't do that in an hour, but at least I want you to know when they should be used, because when you use them in the wrong circumstance, it takes too long. It takes too much time and you don't get good results. And the last one here is to develop win-win strategies. And from now on, win-win is not taking price and cutting it down the middle. That's lose-lose. Win-win is you hit your highest objectives and you give the suppliers high value, low TCO concessions that make them feel really, really good about the deal and excited about the deal. And so what you're going to do, if you follow these steps and if you follow my lead, this is not uh, academic, this is real. You'll slash cycle time, you'll improve your supplier performance, you'll lower your supply chain TCO, and it's increased success. It gives you much more time, free time. Every buyer should have six hours free time every day, but none of them do. They should have time to focus on, on so strategic sourcing, on supplier continuous quality improvement on supplier management, on scorecards, on all of these things, but they don't. They don't have the time, and as a consequence, they're always stuck in reactionary activities, and purchasing gets stuck. So just as a quick note, uh, I offer a lot of uh, group, co group coaching uh, to groups, personal coaching for individuals. I do a lot of seminars for organizations. Uh, I think I mentioned my wife is a gaucho. I come to Brazil. I'd love to come to any of your companies to do seminars. Employer department training and consulting and my contact information is here. You'll have all of my information. I want to give a special offer to everybody that's here. <clears throat> I have uh, 
Well, two special offers, really. I have my book here. It's called Purchasing Advantage, Running a World-Class Purchasing Organization. I wrote this in 2011. And um, it's really every strategy you need to be an outstanding purchasing professional and to run an outstanding purchasing organization. I'm going to give everybody here a free digital copy of this. I sell this to other people. But because uh, I'm, I'm so thankful to be at this conference because Leonardo is such a nice gentleman, um, I want to give everybody here a free copy. I can't have it on the internet out there for too long because I sell this. So it's only going to be out there for the next 24 hours. And if you go to this website here, purchasingadvantage.com forward slash CBEC, you can download a free copy of this uh, anytime in the next 24 hours. And I'll show you. I even put a little por Portuguese line there. So when you go there, this is what you're going to see. Um, it's your presente, okay? Um, so please go out there in the next 24 hours and you can uh, get a copy of, a uh, digital copy of this book. All I ask is please don't forward it around. It's for you only, okay? Everyone agreed? And I think right now uh, I'm finished and we're going to do a raffle. We're going to give away four of my books tomorrow. We'll give away four more. I'm very happy to give